And so we brought together as the Lord's body to worship and fellowship together, to sing, pray, partake the Lord's Supper, and to give back a portion which we have been blessed with and to now go through a, another time of study in a sermon that's going to be presented. Today, our sermon title is The Lord's Invitation, but this was the best illustration that I could, uh, could find online for what I was uh, wanting to present and we're thankful that we have this chance to present this information not only for us that are members of the Lord's body and those that have already received the Lord's invitation, but the fact that we are able to uh, stream the sermon for those that are around in our local area that may be curious as to what our actual aim and goal uh, is considering the kind of information that they're hearing from us. Our goal and our aim is the same as what Jesus was striving to do, and that was seeking to save those that were lost. And in seeking those that are lost, he gives them time and time again the invitation to come to him. Our sermon is going to be coming from Matthew chapter 11, but just as we saw in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gives the statement of whosoever shall come and whosoever shall confess him before men, he will confess them before his father. And that whosoever will deny him before men, then he also will deny them before the Father. The invitation that Jesus then gives in Matthew chapter 11 is similar to that, but we have further information given in this invitation as to what is required on man's part. God's part is the very fact that he has even given us an invitation, that he even calls us in the first place. But in calling us to him, in the invitation, he sets forth conditions whereby we must meet these conditions if we are, in fact, going to receive this invitation. Jesus has just finished discussing with the multitude about John the Baptist and what his mission, what his aim was, how it was that, in fact, he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament of the coming of Elijah. And then he discusses the attitudes and the problems of that very generation, how it was that they were very childish and lacking uh, growth and maturity in that he says, how shall I liken this generation but unto children? They say, we have piped in the streets, but you've not danced for us. We've mourned and you've not come lamenting. And Jesus then says that this is a part of God's doing, that it was in fact God's intention that the wise and the prudent in their own sight would be blinded, but that these things would be revealed to babes, and that they would be revealed to the common people. And at the end of stating that very thing to the multitude, he says that to the crowd, he then turns to the crowd and in the same breath gives the very invitation that we are going to consider this morning, that we're going to study this morning together. that an invitation is given to remove their blindness and that they may be able to receive their sight. And as we said, we learned some very important elements about salvation from what Jesus has to say in his invitation at this time. Preachers have quoted this for many, <laughs> many sermons. But I fear that familiarity, oh, we know what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says. And just because we know what it says, just like with the Pharisees and the people of Jesus' day, okay, you may know what these verses actually say, but you've missed the meaning. Go back and read. Go back and study. And so that's what we're going to do today so as to gather the strength of what is found in the Lord's invitation. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first point that we want to consider is the very first point that Jesus mentions 
in his invitation. He says, come unto me. Jesus has just stated in the previous verses that he, Jesus, is God's revelation to man. That if any man would come to know Christ, they then would in turn know of the Father. And that's the same thing that Jesus had to say in John 14 when they questioned him. How can you say that we have seen the Father? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They are the same in character. They are the same in purpose. They are the same in principle. To know about the Father, to see the Father, is possible because of Jesus coming to this earth. So Jesus says, come unto me. And if you are coming unto Christ, then you come unto the Father as well. What is important about this invitation is that many in the religious world today have this mindset. Well, I don't want to come to Christ. I want Jesus to come to me. Now, what is interesting is that Jesus did go to some people. But if you notice, they had to come to him first. Jesus went to uh, the leader of the synagogue to heal his daughter. But the only reason why he went to that house is because the person, the leader of the synagogue, came to him first. The healing of the lepers, they were healed because they came to him first. What is needing to be realized is Jesus is not following us, but we are to follow him. This invitation of us coming unto him sets forth the first set of requirements. That he extends the invitation, but we have to accept it. And we need to realize Jesus is not chasing us around. We are to go where he is. Now, as we are reading about and studying about the life of Christ, where do we read about Jesus going? Where would we find him if we were back here in the first century? Well, we read about Jesus being in the synagogue. We read about Jesus going to the temple. These are all places of assembly where Jesus would be found. So if you were going to come unto Christ during this time frame, where would you be? You would be at the place of assembly. Now put that into application today. If Jesus were here today and we were wanting to come and be with him, where would he be? He would be here with us. He would be at the assembly where you would be able to find him. Assembled with the church. But as we've gone through our study, we've also made the point that Jesus is also out in the public. To come where Christ is in his physical location, literal location, would be with the brethren. He's with the religious people. But he's also out and about teaching and preaching helping the ones that are in need. And thus, the ones that are in need moves us into the next area, into the next point. Jesus says, come unto me, but who are they that are going to come? In Matthew chapter 10, we looked at how it was that Jesus was sending his apostles out, and he said to them, if any man will, will receive you, he that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth the Father. Who are these individuals that are going to receive? It is those, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come. Well, who? All. The invitation is for everyone. But as Jesus is showing in chapter 11 and in chapter 10, the invitation is for everyone, but everyone is not going to receive it. Everyone is not going to accept the invitation. But who will? 
all ye that labor and are heavy laden. The ones that will accept it are those who feel their need. We can understand this illustration very well. Because you go out and you work physically, you labor physically, and you've got a heavy load that's on you, you feel that. And the people that recognize, man, I have a need. I've got all of this weight on me. And Jesus says, come. Well, guess what? If a person is not willing to, to recognize this. And this is the area where we are struggling the most when it comes to evangelism. We are trying to have people recognize and to acknowledge their heavy load, their weariness, their weakness. And we understand this struggle because do we want to do we want to admit our weaknesses? No, we want to build up our strengths. We want to pay attention to the areas where we are the strongest. To give a presentation as though we've got everything together. Everything is fine. And guess what? If that is your mindset, you're not going to come to Christ. You're not going to come to him because look at what he's offering. I will give you rest. Oh, no, I'm fine. I've got everything taken care of. That type of person is not going to accept the invitation. But the person of Matthew 5, 3, poor in spirit, that recognizes their need, that recognizes, I am struggling. I am laboring. I am under a heavy load. And I need some refreshing. I need rest. Those are the people that will come to Christ. It is those that will recognize the burden that's upon them. Now, this burden is not just the burden of sin. Sin is a burden. But also what's being dealt in this con being dealt with in this context is the fact of what Jesus came to do. In Hebrews chapter 10, it is said in the fulfillment of the book, lo, it is written, lo, Lord, I come to do thy will. I have come to fulfill the first, to remove the first, that I might establish the second. The burden which they are laboring under and that is heavy to them also finds its context in the law of Moses. They are under a system that was put into place to show to them just how weak they actually were. Every day under the law of Moses, you are offering a sacrifice because of sin. Every day you are being reminded, I've committed to sin, I've committed to sin, I've committed to sin. And that gets heavy. That constant reminder of how you are falling short. And Jesus is coming so as to give rest from that. In Acts 15, verse 10, as they are dealing with the subject of circumcision, what are we to teach people? What are we to teach these Gentiles that come under Christianity? Do they still need to be circumcised under the law so as to be saved? John stands up and says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, heavy laden, a tool of labor, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Here are people that are burdened under the law of Moses under the yoke of the law. And this yoke is being contrasted to the law of Christ, 
to the yoke of Christ. Now, I'm getting ahead of my points because I'm not wanting us to lose sight of what's happening here and what we're presenting. Jesus did not come so as to take this yoke away to not put another yoke on. The first yoke is being removed, but there's another yoke that's going to take its place. And even Jesus describes that in this invitation. But he is establishing the fact, I'm coming to remove this first one. The law of Moses, that glory is fading away so that the glory of the second can be established. In fact, Paul also uses the same type of language when writing to the Galatian brethren about the law of Moses. Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Notice how it is described as being a Christian, being in Christ, being in His kingdom, being in His yoke. There's liberty. He has set us free. What is the encouragement that Paul is giving to this church? Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the old law. Paul calls it a yoke. John calls it a yoke in Acts 15. Jesus calls it a heavy laden here. And if you just think about all of the laws that were under the Old Testament system that you would have to try to keep, and you would understand just how heavy that is. And that Jesus came to fulfill all of that. And that's part of the invitation. I am removing this labor, this heavy burden that's being placed upon you so as to give you rest. Jesus invites them to come out from under that load that no one could bear, that no one could keep for a load, for a yoke that is bearable. And you take it a step further that in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus gives further illustration of how the Pharisees were making a difficult system even more difficult. You had religious leaders that were increasing the load and putting things on their brethren that they themselves would not even lift with one of their little fingers. And Jesus says, I'm inviting you into something that's more bearable. The rest that is mentioned, I will give you rest. This does not mean inactivity. You're not coming and accepting the Lord's invitation just to sit around and do nothing. This rest is refreshing. You are coming to be restored. You're coming to be edified and encouraged. To be strengthened and built up. Jesus has already said in his sermons that he is calling laborers. That's how Matthew 9 ended and how Matthew 10 started. Come and follow me. Well, what will we be doing? You'll be fishers of men. You're going to be laborers in my vineyard. Ephesians 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ. Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Christ has done his part. The call has gone out. The invitation has been made. But then comes man's responsibility. He says in verse 29, You want to come unto me? You want to receive this invitation? All right, here's what you have to do. Take my yoke upon you. So you see, Jesus is not removing one burden He's not removing one law system to not replace it with another. Jesus says, yes, that was a yoke, and it's heavy, but take my yoke upon you. 
He extends the invitation, and we must take what Jesus extends. And Jesus said, Jesus is showing he will not force it upon us. Here's what I offer. You can take it or leave it. Jesus is not running around throwing this yoke on people that do not want it. If you don't want it, fine. But you're not going to get what's being offered. But if you will take it, here's the benefit. Jesus does not throw off the yoke for good. He replaces the yoke. He has his own yoke. And if you notice, a yoke is a tool for work. So the rest, uh, you shall find rest unto your soul. It's not activity, inactivity because we're being called to work. You're taking on a yoke to do work. But in your work, you will find refreshment because it's easier. But also, what's being considered, or what should be considered, is just with a yoke, it takes two to work it. It takes two to be involved in this yoke. And the yoke is being described as his. Take my yoke upon you, which means... We are being yoked together with Christ. There is the teacher-student relationship. We are being yoked together with our teacher, which means he's in charge. He's the one that's leading this. He's the one that's driving this. In this situation, a farmer has to determine which two cows are going to work best together. You cannot just throw a yoke on any cows and hope to get the job done. And one of these cows has to be experienced, at least one of them has to be experienced to know what's happening and to know how to follow the commands. So what's being presented to us here? What's being shown to us? This is what it means to come to Christ. He has the experience, and I'm being tied together with him, and I have to follow his lead to get the work done. You have the teacher-student relationship. You have the master-servant relationship. In order to work with Jesus, we have to know what he wants. We have to follow his lead. And guess what? If I don't know what he wants and I'm not willing to follow his lead, what do you think is going to happen if one cow, the inexperienced cow, starts pulling against the experienced cow? Somebody's going to get hurt. You're going to be pulling against this and trying to head off in another direction. You're either going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt both of us. But what's the mentality that many people have? Well, I can come to Christ and just go whichever direction I want. No, you're being tied together with him. Another illustration could be like a three-legged race. You got two individuals, but each leg is tied to each other. If you're not working in unison, you're not going to win. And one of you or both of you could get hurt. You have got to work together. And that's what Jesus is also illustrating in Christianity. We're not just working by ourselves. Christ is, in fact, working with us. Jesus practiced what he preached. He preached it on the Sermon on, on the Mount. And if you want to work with him, this is how you do it. He showed it to us. Even as Jesus sent out his 12 apostles in Matthew chapter 10, how does Matthew 11 start? He is out teaching and preaching. He is showing them how it's done. They are working together. We are co-laborers 
We are fellow laborers in this system, in this new law that Christ has given to us. So just as Jesus preached it, he then shows us how he works. And if we're going to be work, or yoked together with Christ, as we said, he's working also. And that we must follow his lead. If we want to get the job done, we'd have to do it as he did, as he did it. This is not a situation where we get to come into it and we are the one in charge. We are not trying to bring people to us. We are not trying to bring people into our way of thinking. We are trying to bring people to Christ, and that means you have to have His way of thinking. You have to be willing to be tied to Him and follow His lead. And if you're not willing to do that, then do not accept the invitation because this is what you're being called into doing. Take my yoke. And He states, and learn of me. That's our part. You see, you don't just to come, get to come to Christ and think however you want to think. You have to learn of Him. How does He operate? How does He work? So that we can labor together in harmony. The reason why there's so much division in religion, why there's so much division amongst our own brethren, is because we've got a bunch of heifers that don't want to listen. We have a bunch of cows in the Lord's church, and they want to start pulling against this and start heading in their own direction. Well, here's how we think we ought to go. Here's how we think we ought to do it. Just follow the lead cow. Do what he says to do. And the work will get done. The work will be accomplished. Full submission is what's being required. And that's what we're inviting people into. We're inviting people to come and be with other people that have already realized this and are willing to do it. I'm not calling the shots. No other individual here is calling the shots. We are yoked together with the teacher and we're doing the work together. And we are doing it in such a way so where there's safety, there's protection, we can work and be refreshed. But you've got to learn it. You don't come into this already knowing it. Come unto me, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, leads us to the next point. This learning of me is not simply just knowing what the scripture says and knowing what the verse says. To take my yoke upon you, learn of me, shows practice. You've got to work it. You have got to do it. Learning and practice. We appreciate Christianity through living it. Christianity is wasted if it is not going to be lived. Because you can study all of your life. But if you're not going to live what you're studying, you will never learn what it means to be a Christian. You take, for example, James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. A person can read that and read that and read that and never appreciate it if you never do it. If you never do this, it will not mean one single thing to you. But if you actually go out and do this, and you go out and you help some poor little old lady 
that is defenseless, cannot fend for herself, and has nothing to give you. And you see the gratitude and the appreciation that comes from this type of work. And this is a work, a labor that we're called to do in Christianity. You actually go out and do it and you will appreciate why God is telling us to do this. Because it's pure. You're not doing it for any type of recognition. You're not doing it for any type of payment. You are just simply doing this because it is good to do. The ones that will go out and actually practice this and will see the thanks that these individuals will have will leave with a different attitude. And that you will appreciate what this is telling you. And the same applies with everything else that Jesus commands. To go out and to teach people and to help them receive the freedom from sins and to see the joy that that produces, you walk away with a greater appreciation of the Great Commission to go out and to preach to all nations. You can understand why God would tell us to do that. Because it helps us. It encourages us. And it brings meaning to what's going on here. And thus, that's the reason why so many in the denominational world and even some of our own brethren, why they're walking around with no fulfillment in their life is because they're not doing this. Why? Because they're being taught that this doesn't matter. Works are not involved. Is it any wonder then it is such a struggle to get people to recognize the real importance of Christianity? Because they're telling you you can come to Christ without doing anything. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you want to come with me? You better learn what it means. You're taking a yoke. You're going to do some work. But in that work, it's going to be refreshing. It's not going to be tiring. It's going to build you up. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. And that's what John writes about the commandments of God. The commandments that we are following today, John says, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. We take this yoke on us. Why? And his commandments are not grievous. So you see, Jesus says very clearly, Yes, I'm taking a yoke off, but I'm putting a yoke back on. But don't be afraid. Do not be worried. Because the yoke that I'm putting on you, the commandments that I'm putting on you, they're not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're not heavy you will be able to go through and practice these things and you will find refreshment, not just for your physical body, you will find refreshment unto your souls. And so you see, that's what Jesus is offering. Notice the attention that Jesus gives to the soul. He's not talking physical. He's talking spiritually. You have a people that are wearied on the inside, internally. They are struggling. Jesus sees it and he says, I'm offering you something better. And until we recognize our struggle, 
we will not fully come to him. But notice also we have two of the Beatitudes mentioned in this verse describing our Savior. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus says of himself, why would we want to come to Jesus? Look at how he is. He's not like the Pharisees. He's not like the Sadducees where he's going to abuse you. Jesus came in the flesh. He knows what it's like to be physical. And Jesus says of himself, I am meek and lowly in heart, poor in spirit. And Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If we will not behave like this, If I will not take on these characteristics, I will not work well with Christ. But if you will do this, if you will be willing to put this on, he says, take my yoke. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So notice there, even Jesus does not sugarcoat it. Jesus says, oh, it's a yoke. And with any yoke, it's a burden. It's a heavy load. But notice he says, compared to what you have, my yoke is easy. Compared to the burden that you're carrying before, my burden is light. Oh, it's still a burden, but it's light. <laughs> Now, you think about those out in the world and the struggles that they're facing. The burdens of sin that they are carrying. And Jesus says, you can throw that off and take something else on. Take something more valuable. Something that's worth it. If you will put this on, if you will put on Christ, it is work, it takes effort. But in the end, it's refreshing. It's this work that builds us up and that strengthens us to continue on. So we raise the question today. We extend the Lord's invitation. Will you come? Will you work for Christ? In Romans 10, 17, we're told, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have proper faith until you've heard what the word of God has said. That's where faith comes from. You cannot ignore God's word and hope to have proper faith. And many people do not have the proper faith because they try to ignore what God's word has said. Many people think that they can receive Christ, that they can receive the Father without the Word. We've already studied in our Bible class, that's impossible. To receive Christ, you must first receive His apostles. Accept what they teach. Take in what they teach, and then you can receive Christ. In Acts 10, 43, we're told further, once you hear this, to Him giveth all the prophets witness, that through His name, whosoever believeth in Him, shall receive remission of sins. Once you've heard the message, you've got to believe it. Believe in Him. And once you believe, or as you believe in Him, you shall receive remission of sins. But that does not simply mean, okay, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. No, no, no. There's more to the invitation than that. We've already looked at it. If you're going to believe that He is the Son of God, then that means you have to be yoked together with Him. You've got to follow His authority. And just as the apostles continue on, Luke records in Acts 17, verse 30, Paul preaching a sermon, you believe, but you also must be willing to repent. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So if I hear what the gospel says, if I hear what God's word says and I believe it, that means I have to change. 
if I'm going to receive the invitation and I'm going to put that yoke on me, I've got to change my thinking about some things. I've got to start following Christ if I'm going to make it. Otherwise, if I'm not willing to repent, I do not need to put that yoke on because that yoke could kill me. Better count the cost and recognize what it's calling for. And if I have the willingness to repent, believing him to be who he says that he is, Romans 10, 9 and 10, we're told that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If I will hear, and if I will believe and repent, and confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, that means I'm going to take that yoke. It's not simply, okay, I've done it with the mouth. You've got to show me. You've got to follow this through and practice it. You're accepting the invitation. That means you're going to take on this yoke. But if you notice, with all of these, we're still not together with Christ yet. So far, we're being brought, shall be, unto. We're not yoked together yet. Galatians 3, 26, 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. My faith is in Him. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Here we are put together. It is at this point that we are in fact being joined together with Christ to where we can go out and work for Him. And until a person is willing to receive the invitation as it is placed like this, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ, you're not fit for the work. You're not yoked together with Him yet. And even Jesus said himself, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We invite everyone, the Lord invites everyone that recognizes their need to accept the invitation. But if you're going to accept this, that means you're going to put on the yoke, you're going to do the work. And if you will do that, you'll be saved. But if not, if you're not going to believe what the Word has said, then you're going to be lost. And for us, we need to realize, as we have accepted this invitation, and in realizing the work that we've been called to do, we need to take the encouragement that Paul gave to the Galatian brethren. Galatians 6 and verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. As we go about through our Christian life, we need to remember there's work for us to do. And that if we will sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. If we will work the works of Christ, then we will be rewarded. But the temptation is to go out and to sow to the flesh because that seems so much easier. But if we're going to sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. And so here's the encouragement for us. We have accepted the Lord's invitation. We're yoked together with Him. We're going out and doing the work. We have our sins forgiven. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let us remember 
what it is that we have taken on. We are not sowing to the flesh that's going to bring corruption that will just fade away. We are working together with Christ and we are sowing to the things which are spiritual. And it's these spiritual things that we shall reap life everlasting. The things that we are planting, the things that we are growing in our spiritual life, they will follow us into eternity. So what should we remember about the work? His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And that we should not grow weary in it. Because we will receive a reward. So for any that are needing to accept to receive the Lord's invitation, whether it be obeying the gospel for the first time, or for us that have taken the invitation and are laboring together as we've grown weary. Whatever the case is, we offer this time as we stand and sing together. Let's switch the song 149.